Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. It was a lot warmer earlier. I'm pleased to scroll down a bit, but uh, welcome to the Australian Friends of the Hebrew University panel discussion with our good friends, uh, moderated by Professor Leon Mann, and with our panelists Ehud Cohen from Israel and uh, Ashley Wood uh, from uh, Melbourne. Just to tell you a little bit about us, uh, the Australian Friends of the Hebrew University have been long established here in Australia. The Hebrew University doesn't really need any introduction. Uh, as with the University of Melbourne, we talk about Israel's preeminent university and Australia's preeminent university. And tonight has come about because of collaboration between the two universities, in particular between Ehud and Ashley. And uh, it, uh, they work together in Israel and uh, have been together now this week in Melbourne uh, for some joint workshops. Last night there was a fellowship dinner attended by many academics from the University of Melbourne. And uh, the Australian Friends of the Hebrew University promotes collaboration between universities in Australia, not just in Melbourne, but Ehud and I have just come from Perth. And uh, we ran a similar event, which I have to tell you, We're still getting accolades uh, for that event. We didn't have Ashley with us there. Next time we'll take Ashley as well. But uh, it was amazing, and I think that you're all in for a treat and a subject that uh, interests and concerns all of us. So uh, just to tell you a little bit about the people up here on the stage, uh, we have Professor Leon Mann, who's a moderator. Uh, he's a past president and Jub Jubilee Fellow of the Acad 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 sorry, excuse me, Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, an honorary fellow and life, honorary life governor of the Hebrew University. Leon is a social psychologist educated at the University of Melbourne and at Yale University in the US. He's a professorial fellow at the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences at the University of Melbourne. For the purpose of this introduction, all Leon wants me to say is that he's a veteran supporter of the Hebrew University, which he holds in the highest esteem. And I should say that tonight wouldn't have been possible without Leon, and uh, I'm relatively new in this role as the CEO of the Australian Friends, and uh, uh, Leon is an absolute stalwart. He's been a mentor and inspiration, and a lot of what has been happening in Melbourne over the last couple of months, and some of you will have read in the Jewish News, uh, that recently we had Professor Maya Tamir here, from the Hebrew University. We also had Professor Mona Kuri Kasabri, uh, who is the first Arab woman dean ever appointed uh, at an Israeli university. And the Hebrew University really punches way above its weight. And uh, it's not for nothing that it's the only Israeli university in the top 100 uh, of the world's ranked universities, as was, of course, the University of Melbourne. Let's move on now to uh, Ehud. Ehud is an Israeli science, scientist who gained all his science degrees at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He completed his training as a postdoctoral fellow and a staff science at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in California. His research is focused on links between the aging process and neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. He discovered that slowing the progression of aging mitigates neurodegeneration-associated phenotypes of model animals engineered to develop Alzheimer's-like disease. Professor Cohen's group, which is located at the School of Medicine, the Hebrew University asks what goes wrong with aging and explores the mechanisms uh, that enable the onset of de degeneration late in life. Their findings pave the way to the development of novel therapies for Alzheimer's disease and other incurable, devastating disorders. These days they develop new therapeutic cocktails that will hopefully revolutionize the treatment of neurodegenerative disorders and bring new hope to the unfortunate patients and their families. Professor Ashley Bush is probably well known to many of you. Uh, he's a graduate of Mount <coughs> Scopus College and did his medical training specialization in psychiatry and PhD at the University of Melbourne. He then went on to do postdoctoral work at Harvard Medical School and was recruited to the psychiatry staff of Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He returned to Melbourne in 2005 to lead a neuroscience laboratory at the Flory Institute, where he continued his studies of the causes of age-related brain disease such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. He's the scientific founder 
of several biotechnology companies such as Alternity, Collaborative Medicinal De Development, and Cox State. He's recognized as being the top 1% of cited researchers around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Leon Mann, and uh, I think we're in for an amazing evening. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> On my right, because Ehud is from Israel, and uh, Hebrew language goes from right to left. Uh, so we've got Ehud here, and on the left, not necessarily politically, but certainly my neighbour at the University of Melbourne is Ashley Bush. Um, it's terrific that the Australian Friends of the Hebrew University are back in town, and uh, this venue used to be a place not only where the office was, but also many great evenings in which we had visitors. And... Uh, so, welcome back, Australian Friends of the Hebrew University, and Rob Schneider is doing a terrific job. Based in Sydney, but uh, embracing Melbourne, recognising that it's a vital Jewish community, and he is uh, putting, putting the Hebrew University back in place. The, well, the Hebrew University's been in place at, uh, uh, within this Australia and within Australian universities in the Australian community for a long, long, long time. Um, what is happening, of course, is that um, increasingly we are putting together strong collaborations. Uh, often the partnership between the universities and between communities was uh, giving, but now it's giving, receiving, partnering, collaborating. Uh, so I'm very pleased this evening to be moderating uh, what is essentially a panel conversation, a bit of a Q&A in which we have two world experts in the field of neurodegenerative diseases, uh, which have become extremely important, extremely costly in terms of personal lives, social uh, destabilisation within families, uh, economic costs, uh, a whole raft of consequences that come from it, and it's growing all the time. And these two uh, experts in the area are here to answer your questions, to comment about where we are at present and where we'll go in the future. So in the, in the form of a Q&A, if I can give you uh, some working rules, uh, after I've asked what is essentially the lead question uh, of our two panellists, uh, which is what's happening in the world of Alzheimer's research in particular, because within the world of neurodegenerative diseases, uh, encompasses, of course, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and many others, it's the Alzheimer's disease which has become you know, very, very significant because it's growing rapidly with an ageing population across the world. Uh, what, what, what is happening? Where, where, where's the hope? Uh, why hasn't there been the magic uh, cure, the drug that's going to treat and cure? Um, these two people didn't know one another, or they might have known one, known of one another, but you didn't know one another about two years ago, is that right? Maybe two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half years ago, didn't know one another. And yet it's through programs which have been established between two universities, Hebrew University and the University of Norman, uh, in which we have joint research workshops that uh, actually saw the opportunity, told us last night at this dinner at the University of Norman, uh, and he'd heard about uh, Ehud, who had a wonderful reputation, and he reached out, and they now had a, a workshop in Jerusalem in June, or was it May? May, and uh, they, uh, Ehud is spending the week in Melbourne before he returns home tomorrow, in which he's meeting with the Melbourne part of the team, led by Ashley, and it's about a dozen people who are collaborating and building ideas and creating new opportunities to do interesting research uh, in this very, very important field. So the, uh, the Friends, which lends support uh, to this by actually looking after the budget for the joint research workshops, partnering with the University of Melbourne, are responsible for not only bringing Ashley to try get uh, Edward to uh, Australia, to Perth and to Melbourne, uh, but also in supporting the workshop, which is supporting the work that they're going to do and they are doing together. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, I'm going to begin now. Um, we're going to end around about nine o'clock, and Rob, you know, will come back and say a few um, uh, wind-up words. But uh, 
We're going to begin now by asking both of our panellists, why is it that after so much effort, so many attempts over the last 20 years or so, that we, are, we seem to be no further advanced in finding the, the magic bullet, the, the drug that is going to arrest and is going to stop Alzheimer's in its track? Would you like to go first, uh, Evelyn? I can. Please. <clears throat> so, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm pleased to be here in uh, Melbourne. My first time in Australia, and it's a really great experience for me. And regarding your question, I think that um, there were several, I would say, um, direction changes that were required in order to get closer to develop some practical drugs. And I'll give you two examples. One, I think that um, about 25 years ago, there was a... Um, hypothesis that was proposed by two very prominent scientists, and it's called the amyloid hypothesis, and it suggested that actually plaques that are, could be detected in the brain are the sources of toxicity. And because of uh, various reasons, all the research was focused on the attempt to develop drugs based on this hypothesis, and uh, there was not enough room for other ideas. And uh, I think that over 25 years, since you know, there were many attempts and uh, major investments that have uh, failed and we don't have a drug, I think it's time for uh, rethinking and re-evaluating. And a lot of the data, a lot of the scientific information that was accumulated ever since, showing that this uh, hypothesis is probably, I would say it uh, in a careful way, cannot explain all cases of Alzheimer's and probably majority of cases uh, do not develop as predicted by this hypothesis. This is one thing. The other thing is that the, uh, we have to rethink about the process of dementia. Uh, over the years, people tried to cure people who suffered major brain damage. And since the brain is not a regenerative tissue, uh, I think it's very difficult or maybe even nearly impossible to reverse the damage. What we have to do is to start thinking about early detection and early treatment, and uh, maybe establish uh, screens in the populations, and not to try and cure people who suffer from full-blown dementia. So I think we are in a very interesting times in this field, because the uh, very basic concepts now are being re-evaluated, rethinking, and more and more people start to think in new directions, and uh, hopefully it will be more fruitful. Do you want to ask Huh. Sure. So, well, can you hear me? No, I'm sorry. Well, pass that on, and we'll switch up. All right. Okay. Now it's on. Yeah. Well, well, good evening from me as well. Uh, the last time I was here, I was singing Hasidic songs, but uh, I'm wearing a different hat tonight. <laughs> so, uh, I've been involved in trying to think about uh, potential cures or treatments for Alzheimer's disease for now 30 years. It's a long time, and I, I, um, I did my PhD with Colin Masters, who was one of the first guys to actually grind up the uh, human brain for people who would suffer with Alzheimer's disease and extract this little material that accumulates within the brain called amyloid that who mentioned. And that uh, was, uh, he did that in the mid-80s. I started my PhD with him in 1989. And um, at that time, this discovery was hoped, as it would said, to usher in an era where we had a medical fact about Alzheimer's disease, where we could actually see something chemical going on that might be a target for drugs. And it was a very dramatic kind of event to have actually pulled this needle out of the haystack uh, was a big moment for medicine, uh, because prior to that, there wasn't even certainty that Alzheimer's disease was a disease. Uh, it was, when I did medicine, when I did my training in medicine, there was quite a bit of discussion as to whether, uh, as you get old, it is just expected that your brain is going to fail and you will eventually develop dementia. So those facts about what to expect as you get older weren't really known. So it was only really with that discovery that there is this biochemical problem which is actually you can actually chemically harvest out of the brain and see something that shouldn't be there, that it was realized that this is actually a disease. This is not normal aging. And it was a revolution 
at, at that moment. And it became, it, and suddenly, this horrible problem of old age became of interest to researchers. And geneticists got involved, and they actually discovered that there are a number of genes that can cause Alzheimer's disease in a very aggressive way in middle age. And the, the picture in the brain is very similar to what uh, Colin Masters pulled out of the brains of people who had died with non-genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease. So these were very big moments, and that led to a lot of expectations. Um, in particular, at that point in time, a whole bunch of genes causing serious brain diseases were discovered in a row. And that was actually the moment I went to, to Boston. It was a very interesting moment because I went to the actual lab where they cloned firstly the Huntington's disease gene, and then they found the Alzheimer's disease genes, genes for things like Batten's disease, uh, motor neuron disease, was all discovered in the same period of about three years. And suddenly, medical research is saying, huh, these horrible, uh, unlucky uh, brain diseases that are incurable actually have got some kind of uh, biochemical basis that we can at least begin to understand. Now, when this happened in the cancer field, which was in the 50s and 60s, really, when the first genes were beginning to be suspected, it changed everything. And suddenly, medicine became endowed with treatments for these horrible and curable disorders that kill you like from the different forms of cancer. And now we are accustomed to thinking of cancer as a treatable illness. So it took perhaps 20 more years for Alzheimer's disease to get to that same pivotal moment. Uh, but at that point in time, it was thought, well, maybe we're at that cancer moment where we're going to finally get some treatment for these horrible and curable disorders. And that's where the story begins to get more complicated. And the hope that the simple material that Colin Masters had pulled out of the brain was going to explain everything and that the genes would all be related to that, that, that effort was the focus for the next 20 years. And it turned out, which is what happens in science, that it was not so simple. Uh, that these were all important facts but it still didn't necessarily lead to an easy understanding of where you would create the new drugs and the interventions. So we're at a point now where we are capable of cleansing this material that Colin Masters pulled out of the brain, this amyloid stuff. We can actually get rid of it, uh, much the same as you can get rid of uh, acne with uh, appropriate medicine. You can get rid of these spots out of the brain. It doesn't change the outcome. That's the, that's the difficult uh, fact that we have to live with now, that we've succeeded in testing this idea. And it's a bit disappointing. There might be a little bit of benefit in cleansing this material out. We still haven't completely given up on that. But it certainly looks like there's much more to the story. And that's where we are right now. Well, it brings you to the point of what is your next part of the story? What do you hope will be the next chapter? It's your turn. Your turn. <laughs> so I think there should be several uh, next chapters. Uh, first, I think we have to better categorize. I think that uh, basically, if you think about the uh, diagnosis nowadays, uh, people are diagnosed for dementia. They're not diagnosed for Alzheimer's disease, and dementia <laughs> can stem from different mechanisms. It, if, if we look at other fields in medicine, uh, Ashley mentioned the uh, cancer research and uh, oncology. So if you think at uh, breast cancer, for instance, uh, 30 years ago, we couldn't categorize and there were very uh, limited or the number of tools that physicians had in order to treat breast cancer was very limited. And over the years, people learned first to better categorize and develop all kinds of tools that now can be specifically used in order to treat patients suffering from specific subtype. And I think that the, the field of neurodegeneration, and specifically of Alzheimer's, has to undergo a very similar uh, evolutionary process. We need to learn better about the mechanism. We need to understand whether people who suffer from dementia develop this uh, unfortunate condition because of or they succumb to the same toxic mechanisms or maybe to different toxic mechanisms. We have to develop 
additional tools and then to be able to apply them specifically according to the a subtype of uh, disease that each individual suffers from. I also think, as I mentioned before, that we have to start thinking of early detection and early treatment because, uh, as I just saw in one of the meetings, someone uh, presented a very nice uh, analogy. He was showing an avalanche and then he asked the audience, if we remove the snow, Will it rebuild the houses that the avalanche crashed? Probably the answer is no. And it's the same thing in here. When the damage is, uh, and the brain atrophy is significant, I think it's too late. We'll have to start diagnosing er er very early and uh, start treating, treating very early in order to slow down the progression of the disease and provide the individuals who suffer from dementia with uh, the best uh, quality of life possible for the years that they uh, have. And also, I think we should promote a healthy lifestyle. That probably we'll talk about it later. Next chapter. Okay. Let's take. Well, um, luckily, medical research has a very important philosophy underneath it, which is science. And the, the good thing about science is that uh, it doesn't reward, reward you if, if your information is wrong. I mean, that's basically the idea. Unless you can get something useful out of the information, if you can't, if your drug isn't working, the only remedy is to go back to the science to try to understand where you should construct your treatment. And a lot of the field has, has begun to do that. And that's part of the importance in having a dialogue with serious scientists around the world, such as Ehud, so that we can have a look at the facts we've got in front of us and to try to construct new ideas about where you would imagine it would be useful to create, for example, new drugs. Now, drugs are very hard to make. Drugs are essentially chemicals. I mean, I'm, I'm talking mainly about drugs, but there are other therapies for all sorts of disorders. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease, some very different things have been discussed over the years, such as ultrasound treatment, and neurosurgery and all sorts of things. And we can talk about that if you like, but I'm just going to talk about the chemistry since that's the question. In my opinion, and I think in Elwood's opinion too, the best opportunity to fix many of the problems that occur in the brain and Alzheimer's disease that we have identified over the last 30 years of research is to attack the chemistry that's involved and try to create chemicals that will um, modify abnormal reactions that are going on in the brain. So we have to identify these reactions, and we have to make a case for how these reactions might be important in causing the disease. So that's putting it very generally. We, at different labs across the, road, uh, across the world have different emphasis now. So as Edward said, for a long time, Field, the, the field, which may have been about 5,000 researchers around the world, if you count everyone who turns up at the conferences, were, that field was largely looking at one thing, and, and now we've reached a point where we think that one thing doesn't hold all the answers. So we now have to look at other things. And uh, there are lots of other facts that we've discovered over the last 30 years that are very interesting and very important to follow up. Now, my group looks at a particular type of chemistry in the brain to see whether or not we can create drugs based on that chemistry. And indeed, we now have got five different clinical trials with different approaches that are based upon that chemistry. We'll see whether these drug candidates that we have developed will have an impact on the disease. And that's just going to take time. But getting to that point is a product of all the work that preceded it, testing it in the laboratory bench, testing in animals, cell cultures, simple models, and then building up a case about whether uh, an approach could be tested out in the clinic. It's a very long process. So some of the compounds that we're testing now in clinical trials were first considered 20 years ago, and only now have reached a point where there's enough resources to actually think it's worthwhile testing uh, in, in human beings. It's a very, very long road, and part of that is the nature of the disease itself. Alzheimer's disease and dementias in general are slow diseases. If you're going to do a clinical trial, it usually takes a minimum of 
six months, usually 12 or 18 months, to see whether or not your intervention is having an impact on the outcome. And it usually requires lots of people to get that answer. So, for example, in the recently debated results about amyloid that we started off talking about, the, the clinical trials took 18 months and 4,500 people and were spread over 30 different sites around the world and cost $500 million. And that was just one clinical trial. And it didn't work. So the companies that are involved at that level have to be pretty heroic to begin with. And you know they, they don't entirely do it for love. These companies want to make money. And, and if a drug works for Alzheimer's disease, it will be a blockbuster. They will earn billions and billions of dollars for a very long time. But to get to the proof requires this a heroic amount of money and, and, and effort to test, and a lot of time. So there's no fast way of doing this. And results that you get in animals don't necessarily translate into humans. So uh, we're, we're left with uh, the long haul of having to be patient and go back to our science to find the best alternatives to the things that have disappointed us in the past. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. We will get there eventually. This is an absolutely method, methodical way of finding treatments. So it's work in progress, and you're optimistic that eventually you will get there. Um, but it's tough going. Um, but you are now looking at other ways of working uh, with different combinations. Uh, and what I picked up from you, Eklut, that uh, it's not just one size fits all. There are different forms. That's a more sophisticated approach to it all. Okay, I'm now going to go to the audience. So, uh, anyone like to begin by asking a question? We'll hand over the microphone to them. Okay, can we um, uh, perhaps, um, Sharon, could you take this one down to Henry at the back? Thank you, Rob. Thank you for your presentation. I understand that marijuana has sometimes been used for the treatment of Parkinson's and maybe dementia. And there are some proponents of it that some people ignore it altogether. Do you have any views about its role in management? Okay, so you've got the watch. Sure. Yeah, so the, it's not, not so much marijuana as the cannabinoids. So there's a whole lot about 200. Uh, biochemically active compounds that are in the plant, and many of them look to have favorable medicinal qualities that can be uh, capitalized on, and they're being explored in various medical disorders, but particularly neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease. Um, so there is actually quite a lot of effort to study that system, and uh, as far as I understand, there is quite good progress. It, it's on the list of candidate uh, drug approaches that are, are being explored and being tested. And I think that, that it holds considerable promise. When, find, when looking for drugs like this, the, what, what we have to understand with these, comp, these disorders is that, is that they are complex. It's not like there is one cause for any one of these. Even Parkinson's disease, there are like 12 different genes that influence Parkinson's disease, there are five different genes that influence Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and, and what this tells us is that to begin with, what we call this diagnosis is already a simplification. And that's why eventually medicine has to move into a more specific way of categorizing people so that we will understand who might benefit from the cannabinol, cannabinols and who might not benefit from it. So these are the sort of complexities that lie ahead. But that, that kind of progress is being made. We, we're learning how to categorize patients and, and not just give them a simple diagnosis. Okay, and Ahmed might want to add a comment? Just, just uh, one sentence. So I think that uh, one of the revolutions that this field has to go through is the understanding that uh, above the uh, better ca categorization, we need to stop thinking about a single agent which would do the trick. Uh, if you think about uh, other fields, again, if we look at the 
cocktail that people now use to uh, treat HIV, people had all kinds of uh, inhibitors of uh, different uh, proteins of the HIV virus against uh, protease, integrase, some other uh, components. They didn't work one by one. They, just, they only started to work when they were all combined together. And I think we should think in a combinatorial manner. And uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, the active component of uh, marijuana, could be definitely one of those, but I don't think it would be a standalone drug. Okay. Another question? Yes? Yes, I can see how the um, identification of biomarkers or markers of different forms of Alzheimer's would be very useful to categorize. My question is kind of an ethical one. What do you do if you get two really good biomarkers? For example, one defines one class of Alzheimer's and one defines another, but you don't have treatments for either of them. You can just say, well, you're a type A, you're a type B. How do you, how do you envisage handling these issues as time goes on and whether it's wise to inform people of the outcome of their test if you can't do anything about it? Who's going to take that one? Either one of us. You're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow and my, my time is limited because I, I can give you an answer which will end tomorrow afternoon. Basically, you are right. You know, as long as there is no treatment, there is no point of uh, categorizing, but we think that there will be treatment. And I'll, I'll just give you two short examples. So, as we mentioned uh, earlier, me and uh, Ashley as well, people are focusing on removing the plaques from the brain. This is one direction that didn't actually uh, provide a solution. Maybe it would be part of a future solution, but by itself it's not good enough. But there are other aspects. And uh, in my lab, for instance, we address another question. Uh, whether, or we ask what's the um, contribution of aging to these disorders? And if you think about individuals who suffer from uh, early onset Alzheimer's because they carry disease limited mutation, and we know that around the globe, a small minority of cases actually stem from mutations that uh, initiate the development of the disease, they have no symptoms until they are 45 or 50. And it raises a very interesting question. Where are the disease for such a long time? So one of the possible explanations is that these individuals, as we all do, have protective mechanisms that prevent the onset of disease, despite the fact that they carry this mutation from the very first moment of birth. However, aging negatively regulates the activity of these protective mechanisms, exposing the elderly to disease. And if this is true, this, all we have to do is to slow down the progression of aging and prevent the onset of disease. Now, it sounds like science fiction up until like 25 years ago, but we know now that there are genetic mechanisms, and this is one of the nice things in science, that developments that happened in a completely different field now actually can be exploited in order to test new treatments in the field of neurological diseases. We know that we have genetic, uh, genetic pathways that deliberately promote aging. And if we, in simple organisms at the moment, if we engineer mice or worms or flies that actually predisposed to develop disease because they express the same mutated proteins that underlie the development of familial Alzheimer's in patients. If we slow down the progression of aging, we prevent the onset of disease. So this could be one approach. And uh, again, it's not going to stand alone, but in combination of other things that are being developed in parallel now, we will have a treatment. And once we will have a treatment, and I guess that this treatment will undergo evolution as well. It won't be very efficient at the beginning. People will keep testing. People will add more agents, maybe remove some agent, better refine it, but eventually we will have a combinatorial treatment. And once we will have, then diagnosis, then categorization would be valuable. Okay, so ethics and the use of biomarkers. <laughs> so, so I, obviously, I've had a long time to think about this, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that it's important to tell my patients what I think their diagnosis is and what subcategory they are, and I take note with the same 
promises I, I give myself is that I won't waste any time if I, if I hear of a treatment that would potentially impact that category of diagnosis. And so even though there might not be anything immediate that, that I can offer, I think to be organized so that as soon as there is any uh, wind of something that might be a, a useful intervention uh, is known, then, then I can uh, direct the patients towards that. And, and in fact, this has consequences elsewhere because I, I am involved in quite a few clinical trials of agents that are being tested to try to modify diseases that are not Alzheimer's disease, but also involve death of brain tissue or spinal cord tissue. And uh, earlier this year, for example, we had this um, result with uh, uh, a drug that was tested in motor neuron disease. Uh, and this, uh, we had startlingly good uh, results on the first time that it was tested in humans. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a big moment. It was like something we hadn't seen before ever. This drug is now going on to phase two testing and, and it's going to build up its body of evidence. But suddenly, I was telling people with this incurable disorder, motor neuron disease, don't feel like there's no hope whatsoever. Like there are, there are these little tantalizing bits of evidence that something's going to emerge and some clues that there is potentially treatments on the immediate horizon. And this makes a big difference to people. Uh, and so, you know, we as researchers never give up hope, even if we're disappointed, because we still. In fact, failure is a very important part of being a researcher. Once you have a good, clean, negative result, you move on to the next thing and you feel like you've been illuminated. And in the case of what I've been doing now, I take, I, I have cast the net fairly wide in terms of treatment options to test different ideas out. And now and again, I'm seeing these glimmers and this gives me hope and it gives, therefore, the patients hope. And so I have no hesitation in giving them as much detail as possible. I also encourage them to participate in research and to volunteer, if not for clinical trials, then in patient registries, which is a very important way of doing research. We, can't, we have set up in the last 12 months uh, uh, the ADNET, which is the Alzheimer's disease uh, network. Uh, it's a registry of people who have got either early cognitive changes or early Alzheimer's disease throughout the country. Uh, it's been funded by $18 million uh, investment from the federal government, from the NHMRC, and it's a very important resource so that every time that we have an idea, we don't have to kind of find people to volunteer for the research. So we have these patients already ready to go. It's terribly important to keep us organized for the research. Another question. Thanks, Sharon. Um, a hypothetical question. If someone who doesn't suffer from Alzheimer's came to you and said, what can, is there anything I can do now to prevent myself from getting up or reduce the chances of my having Alzheimer's in the future, what would your answer be? Thank you. So, you hear that? Hear that? Everyone hear that? Yeah, the, the question was, what can be done in order to minima, uh, minimize the risk for Alzheimer's in the future? Uh, nowadays, right? Um, so, um, first you should have good genes, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, seriously speaking, I think there are three major uh, lifestyle uh, things that should be considered. First is obviously a healthy diet. Uh, I believe that it, I'm not preaching for uh, being vegetarian, but I think reducing the consumption of red meat was shown in various studies to have, uh, I would say, health benefits on, on different aspects, including we know why uh, red meat can also promote the acceleration, at least in model animals, of, uh, of neurodegeneration. So it's a good idea to reduce this. And also, you know, everything that you hear from your, your doctors, you know, eat your vegetables and different colors and things. It's important to keep uh, yourself active physically, and every single person should be active according to their uh, capabilities. If someone can only walk around the block, so do that. Someone else can do more, even better. Um, 
There were studies that were conducted in mice showing that uh, enrichment, like intellectual enrichment, can prevent or at least postpone the onset of disease in these animals, and I think it can be also translated to humans. So keeping yourself uh, active, um, I'm talking from the cognitive point of view, like read, learn, talk to people, socialize, uh, do Sudoku, or whatever you like to do, but keep yourself active, was shown that at least if it can be translated from animals to humans, it uh, should help as well, and it's definitely uh, does no harm. And I think in general, enjoy the time that you have as long as you're healthy and uh, feeling well. Sorry, brief attend friends of the Hebrew University meetings. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that's all definitely true. Um, I could add to that that uh, blood pressure control is terribly important for the risk of dementia. So that's particularly important for midlife blood pressure. So in your 40s, if you've got high blood pressure, this can remarkably increase the risk for dementia later on. So generally, the risk factors for dementia are the same as the risk factors for heart disease. So. And I would definitely endorse the, the concept of staying active and exercise in particular. Um, you're never really too old to exercise. So even if it's been a long time since you've done any resistance exercise or lifted a weight, it's still, it's still possible. If, you, if you've managed to walk here tonight, then you're capable of doing exercise and increasing your muscle bulk. And what happens in advanced age is that there is a tendency for people to think that they can't actually keep their muscle mass. And it's important to fight against that if you can. So, and that's just with simple mobility and a little bit of exercise and um, keeping a, uh, a, a good quality diet, a diet that's got enough protein in it, not uh, heavily um, heavy in the carbohydrates. So we know quite a lot about how to advise people to stay in a state of fitness. It's a, there's an interesting relationship between the brain and the body organs in the periphery, muscles and gut, for example, which you don't usually, you know, we didn't used to think about that like 20 years ago, but it's certainly true. So, for example, your muscles are very important for the metabolism of glucose and insulin. And if your muscle bulk reduces, you have trouble in adjusting the levels of uh, insulin and glucose, and this can lead to problems with the brain. And there are also, uh, there's also a relationship between the gut and the chemicals that it produces and its influence on the brain, which we're understanding more and more. So the quality of your diet and the, your, um, your gut health matters a great deal for the health of the brain. We're beginning to understand this all a lot better, but we can certainly make the recommendations based upon ep epidemiology that looking after the rest of your body is tremendously important to protect your brain's health. And I should add that Rob took us out for dinner before this evening, and our two experts, Ashley here ate only vegetarian, and Edward only ate fish plus vegetarian, and there was no interest whatsoever in red meat. Yeah. <laughs> but we drank lots of wine. And we drank lots of wine. <laughs> not lots of wine. <laughs> now there are lots and lots of hands. And, uh... <laughs> but, but of course you're right that prevention would be the best. But uh, given uh, some degree of neural damage, what do you think about work in stem cell research and attempts to reconstruct neural circuitry. What's your view out of information to Parkinson's, which is more than this? Thank you. You want me to answer that question? <laughs> uh, yeah, so stem cells, are, they're, they're going to be the building blocks of the future for sure. Uh, right now, it's a bit... You, right now, we know that it's not so easy as to take a, a brain that's damaged in certain parts and there are neurons that are dead and try to replace them with stem cells. It's not so easy because there is a disease process going on and the tissue is, um, uh, is, is manufacturing abnormal chemicals which are going to kill off healthy cells that go into that vicinity. So to some extent it's been possible to replace some lost brain tissue in Parkinson's disease, for example. There's a little bit of success there and so it looks promising. But until we really understand what causes the cells to die in the first place, 
it, it seems to me that it's, it's a bit of a lost cause to send you know, good tissue into a bad vicinity. It's going to be killed off by whatever it is that killed off the cells in the first place. But it's still a very important facet of medicine, medical research for us to understand. Because in terms of peripheral organs, it's a little bit easier. So, for example, to transplant tissue is, is a principle that we understand very well. And we're usually transplanting tissue that uh, has in its own nature the ability to grow or be replaced. The brain's not like that. Once the neurons are laid down, the, they turn over very, very slowly. You, you can repopulate uh, cells that are lost in the brain, the neurons. You can repopulate them, but they repopulate very slowly. So it's not as easy to transplant in things that are lost with those sort of procedures. Maybe one day that would be possible. So it's the sort of research that needs to be done, but it's, uh, it's a bit further down the track. I think we're, I would think, my personal bias is to figure out the biochemistry first of what's killing the cells in the first place. Who's next? Robert, you got a... Okay. Dairy product. Dairy, well, the quick one while that's setting up. Dairy products, this is the first one. Your favorite dairy products. Okay. I just want to say a word about the, the previous question regarding uh, stem cells. So basically when we talk about stem cells, we need to, uh, to define two different possible interventions. One, stem cells that are naturally uh, present in the brain and uh, which actually give rise to what's called neurogenesis. So it's, it's uh, sparked hope in the, I would say, in the last decade when people found that there are such stem cells, but it's pretty limited. It's only in two sites in the brain, and there are many debates whether the cells actually really keep proliferating uh, in the adult brain. It was shown that uh, people, uh, young people, like 17, 18, it's still pro proliferative, but some people claim that it does not happen later on. Regarding the, the, the second um, way of thinking about uh, the stem cells is the uh, transplantation, as uh, Ashley mentioned, and uh, there were some attempts to transplant uh, Parkinson's patient with cells, and the major problem is that uh, over several years, those cells which were transplanted, they started to look like old cells because the cues from the environment are critical for the welfare and for the development of cells. So actually they start dying and uh, it, overall it was a failure with the technologies that we have nowadays. We have to uh, change the environment, the cellular environment and cues which we don't fully understand how it works and maybe in the future it will be uh, applicable. But at this point, I think we are far from having uh, therapies which are based on stem cells. Regarding dairy, so one of the um, uh, pathways that I mentioned before that which promote the progression of aging is the pathway which is activated by a hormone which is called insulin-like growth factor, IGF. And uh, IGF is, uh, there are pretty high levels in uh, dairy products. So again, I don't think that we should totally avoid it, but I think it's not a good idea to overconsume. This is my personal view because of the high levels of IGF. But again, like anything else, things should be balanced, and uh, I don't think that we should totally avoid. I, I don't think that we should overconsume. Good. Next question. Yep. Is it hereditary? Is Alzheimer's hereditary? Okay. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> because uh, first, as, as mentioned, as I mentioned before, uh, there are families that individuals, members of this cohorts, they uh, carry specific mutations that underlie the development of familial Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this is accountable for, or this phenomenon is accountable for a small minority of the cases. It depends who you ask, but it's anywhere between 2 to 5% of the cases. Uh, the question is whether it is the same disease as the sporadic disease that onset with uh, no known mutation, it's an open question because there are diff major differences between the mechanisms underlying these disorders. So it could be inheritable, 
but not necessarily. Now, when we talk about sporadic cases, we also know about genes that have different variants. Uh, for instance, maybe the most known, the, the best described one, known as APOE, and APOE has four different variants. Individuals who carry variant 4 and 4 in two chromosomes, they have much higher chances to develop the sporadic Alzheimer's, and those who have 2 and 2, they have much lower. So it doesn't mean that someone who carries 4 and 4 would develop, but this individual has higher chance to do that. So again, there are some, uh, I would say, genetic combinations that increase the risk, and some other which decrease the risk. But, um, so in a way, it's, it's yeah, it, uh, somewhat inheritable. Yet, most cases are developed with known, not known uh, genetic uh, uh, structure that we can identify. How do you intervene to find out if you carry it? Uh, so, so I'm not... Is magic, you, what, so I'm not familiar with the Australian law. Maybe Ashley knows better about it, but in other countries, it's uh, because there is no treatment. It's uh, there are no such uh, screen or um, test which is uh, legal. It could be done, in, I mean, practically in the lab. It's it's, it's not a, a very significant task to to amplify this area in the DNA and sequence it. But it's not allowed by law in other countries. I don't know about Australia. Mm. But yeah. uh, you, you, yeah, you can do it in Australia if you want to, if you've got the money for it. Uh, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. Uh, but then the question is what you do with the information. So uh, now, it, and the, the answer to that isn't simple. It's it's the context. So uh, there are families where the Alzheimer's disease is traveling in what's called an autosomal dominant pa pattern. That means that 50% of the children will inherit the disease and they, the average age of onset for this aggressive form of Alzheimer's disease is in mid 40s. And the youngest case ever was 18 years old. So, and, and there are some gigantic populations around the planet. For example, there's a big family group in Colombia, thousands of related people and 50% of them develop Alzheimer's disease by the age of 45. It's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, so there are some of these type of families in Australia and they are faced with the dilemma of do you want to know or do you not want to know? And do you want to make preparations given that the, the thing about these type of mutations is that you can predict pretty accurately within a couple of years when the person is going to dement. So it's a, it's a very strong genetic influence. Uh, it's, it's not a common uh, uh, gene. It's not like a, something which is commonly seen. Most cases of dementia are not caused by these sort of strong genetic influences. Most cases of dementia begin in the 70s. But this is, these are the special genetic forms. They're very important for science because if we can understand what is going on there, and we, we know the gene, we know the, what we call the molecular machinery, we know what proteins are influenced by this, and so it gives us a number of important clues which are like finding the coordinates in a, in a jigsaw puzzle. You know, it gives us something really concrete to start with that doesn't immediately explain how the disease is caused. But the practical question is, what do you do with, uh, as I say, with the information? And it, that depends upon what the family says to you. So I have families who say to me different things, and I have to interpret their wishes and what the responsibilities would be in, once that information is known. In, in uh, you can get your whole genome screen nowadays. You can send your DNA off to a company in the U.S. that's 23andMe is probably the most uh, well-known company, and you can get a whole array of genes tested. And uh, if you are in the United States, they will tell you what your risk is for a whole bunch of things, including dementia, and what do you do with the information. Well, this is this is where medicine is heading. It tells you what your vulnerabilities are and where you have a chance of changing your lifestyle or taking some type of intervention which might involve medical treatment to reduce your risk for the outcomes. That's personalized medicine. That's eventually where we'll go. So we have to learn how to handle information ethically as we, as we adapt to knowing how to get this information. Okay, you've been waiting patiently. My question was more to do with Parkinson's and just where 
research is currently sitting for Parkinson's and where it is heading. But then attached to the previous question about Parkinson's um, also being hereditary, um, how often is that likely to be? And if it is, what do you do? So I'll, I'll answer shortly. So first, uh, Parkinson's disease is one of the diseases that uh, it's relatively critical because, uh, as you probably all know, people developed years ago the um, idea that uh, the injection of L-DOPA or prescription of L-DOPA actually with dopamine can help. And, and I'm not a physician, but I know uh, that uh, this disease can be relatively well managed compared to other neurodegenerative disorders. Some of the um, research direction that I described before, such as manipulation of aging or um, preserving the cellular uh, environment, could be also applicable for uh, Parkinson's disease. And then, in combination with other approaches, it could be it could uh, enhance the treatment. And I believe that this this is what will happen in the future. Regarding uh, the in, uh, inherited whether it's inherited disease or not, I, the answer is very similar to what we both discussed regarding the Alzheimer's. There are some genes that specific mutations are known <coughs> to cause early onset uh, Parkinson's disease and some others that increase the risk, but the majority of cases onset sporadically and uh, we don't recognize, we don't know to, to uh, define specific genetic, uh, I would say, combination that analyze the development of disease in those cases. But in some cases, we do not. Okay. Um, yes. You speak of uh, various types of dementia rather than just Alzheimer's. Are there any types of dementia in which there would be progress such that, say, of A or B type, that there are possibly some solutions or a bit more optimism than there may be in a general sense? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Well, firstly, um, if a person has, is developing memory problems, goes to the GP and, and complains about it, it's, people should take memory problems seriously, uh, a GP nowadays would be more likely to refer on to a specialist like myself for more investigation and for diagnosis and for uh, potential treatment. And the reason that this is really important, this very simple idea of how, how, how we should manage people with memory problems, is that 5% of people who have got, who come to the GP and say, my memory is problematic, they actually have a reversible cause for that problem. So, and it, it can sometimes be really trivial uh, for example, it can be thyroid problems or folate deficiency or uh, vitamin D deficiency. The whole, actually, the whole list. And it takes, um, it, it often takes a specialist. And obviously, there are many competent GPs, but it's better to go see a specialist to check off all of the potential treatable causes of dementia. That's quite an impressive list. Uh, and it's very satisfying, too, because one in 20 of my patients who are called demented actually recover. So this is quite nice to see when that happens. Uh, it's very satisfying. Everyone's very happy about it. The family's delighted. Um, and it can, it can sometimes be miraculous, uh, the kind of recoveries that you see. So that's just ordinary medicine, nothing fancy. So then the, the remaining cases uh, can be categorized, as you say. And, and some of those categories are, you would have a sense of the being more mystifying than others and more of a sense of well, what, what could we hope to uh, intervene with. Uh, but generally speaking, we will, at the beginning of doing that categorization, we'll try to find the people who are suffering from vascular problems first. So people with peripheral problems in their arterial treats, so uh, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, so forth. If you can improve a person's vascular health and get their cholesterol normalized, get their blood pressure normal, 
you can at least slow down a component of the causes of dementia that's related to that contribution, which is a very serious fraction of the total, maybe 20% of the ones who, are, who uh, are not easily treated. And then the remainder, you start to siphon through things like Alzheimer's disease, uh, Lewy body dementia, which is related to Parkinson's disease. There's a, a, a syndrome called frontotemporal dementia. We start categorizing at that point. And at that point, we're now thinking these are not really treatable with anything we know apart from symptomatic treatment. And the symptomatic treatment becomes important. We use it and we can boost function a little bit for a while with agents that are essentially stimulants. Uh, but as I said earlier, that category becomes useful in terms of contemplating what other people are doing in the field and if something emerges on the horizon that would be very useful. So I, I send those patients for more advanced scans if they want them. Uh, and these give me more information. For example, there is an amyloid scan that's available in Melbourne. Uh, it, we can now do it as a research tool so that it doesn't cost people any money and it can tell you whether or not you have actually got Alzheimer's disease, even if it's early Alzheimer's, like it's a, you're not very severely affected yet, but the amyloid's in your brain and you qualify for that diagnosis. Now that means that if there is a clinical trial available for people with that category of dementia, there's pretty efficient entry into that trial and they can volunteer much more efficiently. So that's, it's useful. It's useful for the foreseeable future about how you would, if people are motivated to try to try something alternative or get into a clinical trial, that sort of information is, is going to be useful. Eventually, when we have treatments, it will be essential to have that kind of categorization because these are all different types of diseases that cause dementia. Alzheimer's disease is probably the biggest single part of that group. I think that uh, it's all right. Ashley was pretty thorough. Yeah, yeah. that's a good question, Barry. Okay, there's one over here, Rob. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm interested in terms you mentioned about um, weights and doing walks around the blocks. I'm interested if there's any sporting activity or physical activity that we could do that's good for the brain, like yoga or boxing or martial arts. <laughs> no, because I was reading also that with meditation they claim it can um, um, undo the plaques in the brain. So I'm interested also from the sporting perspective and also from the meditation perspective, if there's been any research on that, um, or if not, if they're going to be, if that can help. <laughs> so, boxing is not good. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think in general that um, <laughs> hitting your head is even worse. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm not aware, maybe Ashley uh, is better informed, but I'm not aware of a specific type of sports. Um, I think that uh, as long as the cardiovascular system is active, as long as people spend enough time in sports, and it could, could be running, cycling, swimming, or any other type of sport, um, I think that the benefit would be there. At least uh, I'm not aware of any... Uh, study showing that one type of sport is superior over others. Regarding um, um, yoga or uh, meditation, stress has been shown by uh, various studies to be deleterious in, again, by various aspects, including for the health of the brain. So I think any activity which could uh, relieve stress and uh, you know, provide peace of mind I think it's a good idea, and most likely it's also beneficial for in this aspect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that all of that's true, and specifically things that lower cortisol levels and stress rise, raises cortisol levels, and cortisol levels are elevated in people with dementia. Um, in terms of the type of exercise, my colleague Nicola Lautenschlager, who's uh, uh, the head of the department of psychiatry at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and we was part of our uh, research dinner last night. She actually has researched this and come up with some more specific guidelines. What she's found is that um, the magic number to reduce the risk for dementia is 150 minutes of, of uh, uh, exercise per week, and that and the definition of that is elevating your uh, resting heart rate by 
uh, 40 beats per minute. So go back. So if your resting heart rate is let's say 80, you go up to 120. It's not too bad, really. So, but you have to sustain that for 150 minutes in a week, and that seems to be fairly. Uh, it's a it's a a number that has been studied in her trials, and it seems to be uh, a threshold that that's meaningful. Um, that that's kind of useful information because it's hard to to, to know exactly where the, the limits are here, uh, what's what's effective. But it's reassuring that you don't have to really pulverize yourself in order to get some benefits. That, to translate to reducing the risk of dementia. One other thing I do want to say about, I'm not, I understand what you meant about boxing as a cardiovascular exercise. <laughs> yeah, it's very aerobic, and as long as you're not hitting your head, that's, it's going to be fine. But I'll tell you, hitting your head is actually a major risk for dementia. And the, the interesting thing is how much we've learned about it recently because of the crisis in the football world. So not just... Uh, not just AFL, where we're beginning to realize that it's bad to be hit in the head, but already the, the National Football League in the U.S. has got this major problem with uh, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and, uh, and now uh, soccer is the same thing. That, this, that There was a major paper recently reporting exactly the same problem, that heading the ball is actually a concussion, and that can lead to the same problem. So uh, it's a shame, because I, you know, I like those sports, but uh, I pity the people who have to play them. Absolutely. Uh, dancing is a wonderful, is a wonderful uh, activity, and it's very good for all, all of all of the above. What about music uh, as a therapy? Music. Music. <laughs> so there are uh, some studies uh, pointing at music and. Uh, I think it's, uh, again, it uh, falls under the title of uh, stress relief, socializing, lowering the level of cortisol, as uh, correctly mentioned by Ashley. And uh, it's a very nice and enjoyable activity, you know. I, I think that uh, it definitely doesn't harm anyone. <laughs> as long as it's not head-banging music. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, more questions. Yes, Barry. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I, I'm, oh, sorry, ma'am, I, I do apologize. I'm going to um, bring the stress level down. I just, I just wanted to ask you, obviously, as you get older, you forget things. Well, I do. But um, how can you differentiate between forgetting things and early onset dementia? How do you... Do you, I mean, if you go to a doctor and you say, I'm, I'm forgetting things, what's the difference between aging and early onset dementia? How can you, how can you make that, that connection, what the, the difference? And my other last question, sorry, is before you answer that, is how advanced is it for medication not to assist a dementia patient? So if someone's having some medication, and they've been prescribed the medication to potentially prolong, which is what you said in the beginning of your, your talk, when can that not make a difference to someone? So regarding your first question, and uh, again, I will hand, hand the mic to Ashley afterwards, he's a physician, but in general, dementia is uh, many times characterized by losing the very uh, fundamental information that we have uh, since we are very young. I'll give you an example. If you forgot where you put your keys or your glasses, you're probably getting older and your memory is not as good as it used to be. But if you have your keys or glasses and you don't remember what those items are good for, <laughs> this, this is a problem. <laughs> also, Also, demented people many times uh, at the early stages of uh, dementia, they start losing the orientation of uh, items to where they belong. So if someone puts a cooking pan in the, in the closet or uh, the, I don't know, the laundry in the, in the fridge, this is a problem. So basically we're talking about phenomenon that uh, impairs the very fundamental things that people learn from the very young, including, by the way, 
ability to calculate, the ability to set the clock to a certain time, the ability to, to write and use letters appropriately. So these are uh, um, specific things that uh, actually show Im impairment of very basic, very fundamental uh, capabilities. Unlike, you know, if the flow of information that we get, if you forgot where glasses are, it's probably fine. <laughs> 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 so so the, the simple trick is, uh, is the symptom getting worse? So if, if you're worried today about forgetting things in two months' time, is it any different? Is it the same? Is it worse? If it's worsening, then it's something to perhaps consider <coughs> worrying about. We, we studied this actually. Um, in, in large cohorts of people, and uh, there is this category of people who, who reach their senior years who are worrying about their memory, and they're called subjective memory complainers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a very important category. And, and what we've done with these groups of people, which we, we study maybe a thousand people at a time, to see what happens to them over time. Are they more at risk? And it, the, the answer is kind of common sense. <laughs> like about half of them never deteriorate. So they're just worried about being older. Are they Jewish? Yeah, Leon says they're more, it's more common than Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish genetic <are> factor. <laughs> but, but another half are actually coming down with something which is going to develop more. And that's the thing about these d dementias is that they do actually gradually deteriorate. Uh, some of there's a, there's one form of dementia which is more abrupt, that's caused by many strokes, that's called vascular dementia, I sort of touched upon that before, that's a different type, that's where suddenly the next day you've got a really obvious functional loss of some kind and you don't regain that. Uh, but the other forms, such as Alzheimer's disease, is a steady deterioration. So that's how uh, most doctors would determine whether or not a person who's got subjective memory complaints, perhaps coming down with something worse, they say, is it getting Worse. Does, the, does the family agree that this is a problem which is getting worse over the last few months? Hmm. Barry? Uh, and, and Morris? Or? Let, let's take but, Morris because uh, Barry, you, uh, you've Morris. had one and we'll give you a bit of Barry after. This is the Dorothy Dixon because we, Leon and I discussed it the other night. That's right, we've On said the subject of more common in Jews, um, Parkinson's seems to be much more common in Jews. And the impression is that within the community, the people who get it are substantially cleverer than most of the community. Is there any data on this? Uh, I've been looking for it. Does anyone know any data on it? Uh, okay, you've got the mic. Well, <laughs> well, the reason that it's more common in Jews is because of uh, a gene called LARC2. And that's a gene which is more common in Jews and it increases the risk for Parkinson's disease. So that's the simple answer uh, about being smarter. Because the gene is, is, is one of the Jewish genes. Jews have got certain genes that, are, um, uh, that cause neurological disorders. That's part of, I guess, being a little bit inbred, perhaps. Uh, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's, how it, that's why this is the case. I, there's actually a horrible uh, neurological disorder called Tay-Sachs disease, you may have. <coughs> I know a great joke about it. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> tell us. Okay, uh, so um, do you want to comment on the Jewish connection? With, uh, yeah, uh, nothing to <laughs> add here. Uh, which Jew, I mean, Sfadi and Ashkenazi, according to your analysis, Morris? Are they well, well I, I just looked it up, but so, uh, Ashkenazi Jews have got the lack too, but the question, the impression I have is that it occurs among the cleverer members of our community. And the question is, has this been defined? Is there, are there any studies on this? So it's, it's a subjective impression. Okay. Uh, Evidence? I also think so. You know, I, I'm, I'm an Israeli, so the Jewish population is much larger. And I can assure <laughs> that there are very smart Jewish people, but uh, all the way to the other side of the spectrum as well. <laughs> so it's a spectrum disorder. <laughs> Well, I think that uh, given the current state of political and uh, paralysis, uh, maybe there is a syndrome that's... Uh, more questions. Uh, yes, please. 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 Yes,
tell me, please, does OCD have any connection to dementia? Does OCD have any connection to dementia? That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's actually not, not such an uncommon psychiatric diagnosis, uh, but it can actually emerge uh, in, in dementia because if a, a person is coming down with a dementia like Alzheimer's disease, where the wiring of the brain is actually being pulled apart slowly, neuron by neuron then some of our underlying personality features can change. And so we, there is a phase before a person becomes actually diagnosed with dementia where they develop symptoms in their personality. So they can become, for example, depressed or anxious or OCD can emerge. So they can develop symptoms of obsessionality. And sometimes it can become quite serious. It can be treated by psychiatric drugs. So it's... it's so one of the complications of the natural history of dementia that psychiatrists have to be aware of. So it can be hap it can occur, but to my knowledge, there is no increased risk of dementia if you suffer from OCD. So that's a that's a disorder that commences often in uh, early adulthood and uh, can then last the whole life. It, it, it can be treated, but it, it, it in its own right as a psychiatric disorder doesn't increase the risk for the dementia. Okay. You wanna... okay. okay, I think we're going to have time for three more questions. So, uh, Madam? Before when we were talking about, I'm sorry, the uh, benefits possibly of sports, or maybe the lack of benefit of certain sports. I want to pursue something else that is rather related to it, and that is, is there any relationship possibly or proclivity toward dementia or lack of it from hormone levels, such as increased progesterone or possibly testosterone? Is there any correlation possibly to longevity of sexuality or lack of it? Uh, it would strike me as being similar to an athletic sort of thing and probably quite widely practiced. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So, actually, I make two comments on, uh, in answer to this uh, question. First, uh, dementia is becoming more and more uh, a disease of uh, women in the West and uh, in the United States, the statistics show that about two thirds of the patients are women, and about one third is men. It's, it's the same thing in uh, Canada and in Israel. I don't know about the Australian statistics. I guess it's similar. similar. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the truth is that people don't know what's the reason. But uh, one of the leading hypotheses is uh, that the levels of hormones actually play a major role in this regard. So it could be. But what, uh, what I can tell that uh, studies that were published um, around 2003 uh, have shown that um, people who suffer from dementia, they have relatively high levels of IGF, the insulin-like growth factor, in their uh, CSF, in their uh, spinal fluid. And um, the correlation is there. I'm not sure that uh, there is a proof of, of causative, but it's very likely that hormones do play a role in exposing the elderly to dementia. I mean, a higher level of certain hormones and lower of uh, other hormones. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, all, that's all true, and it's an important field to figure out uh, what the connection might be. I think we, we're, the, the field in general is, is, is not saying that the hormone changes of aging uh, can cause a dementia, they can influence it. So it's a factor, but, but not really a, considered a, a major biochemical cause. Um, but having said that, in terms of general health with advanced age, you, you touched upon the issue of sexuality in, in advanced age. And there are many uh, medical researchers who believe that that's a facet of health, just like cardiovascular health, that if it's maintained, it's going to be useful for increasing longevity and, uh, and cognitive health. 
So this, uh, it is a facet of, uh, of lifestyle which is important to attempt to. There is, there is good information about it right now. So, yeah, I can, can go more into it, but uh, perhaps not right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think the uh, lady here in the front row. Yeah? There was somebody from right. the head. That's her. Yes. Uh, could you please elaborate on the thyroid influence on dementia and the treatment of it? Apparently, there are some good results. I think you would raise the thyroid. <laughs> yeah, so, so thyroid, thyroid abnormalities are one of the causes of dementia, usually hypothyroidism, and uh, it's uh, easily treated. Hyperthyroidism, so overproduction of uh, thyroid hormones, can cause severe changes in cognition, uh, which are a different sort of picture, but can also mimic severe brain diseases. So the thyroid is one of those hormonal organs that we check out early in terms of assessing people who've got uh, memory problems. The use of thyroid hormone as a treatment for cognitive loss has been studied, and it's not to be recommended. It's, uh, it's got too many side effects and uh, if you drive up thyroid hormones beyond a certain threshold, it causes a number of uh, side effects which can be very unpleasant and, and uh, can cause health problems. So it's not it's it's been thought, thought about because the thyroid can activate metabolism so so well, but uh, like most of the things in your body, it has to be kept within a normal range, and too much can be quite bad for you. Okay, I think we're just about there. Okay, so there's one more. Thank you. Um, I just want to seek some amplification about a question that has already been asked. Um, about When you mentioned about what are the keys for or where you put the keys. If, if say, for example, the, the memory is a, is a container, then obviously as you get older, there's more stuff in the container. The box is getting full. So if you find that you're forgetting when you reach advanced age, um, is it because of the fact that there are too many things in there and you can't remember? Whereas, if you're when you're a child, obviously when you're, when you're born, the, th the thing the box is empty, and then through experiences through life, is that an analogy? And could you just amplify? It? Because, in other words, how, how do you know whether your forgetfulness is because you've just got such a hell of a lot to remember because you are had a full life, or because uh, you're losing a memory? So I think this analogy is a, a simplification of the situation. Uh, the truth is that we don't really know much about how memories are created and stored. We, we know a lot, but uh, we don't fully understand it. What is interesting in this regard is that many times people who have short-term memory problems, so they can't uh, restore memories, they have no problem to tell you about things that happened many, many years ago. And it looks like, in a way, that memory is built in layers, but we also have the power to forget. So I don't think that the analogy of, like, a, a, I don't know, a hard disk of a computer which is getting full is, is, is correct, because we have the capacity to prioritize our memories, and, and uh, storing them is not, the, not the major thing, but restoring them is critical. So, so I don't think that this is the case. I don't think that we have a final capacity that's at a certain point being exceeded. I don't believe that this is actually any, a valid explanation. It's actually dementia caused some problems in our ability to record new memories, and also once we have them, with from short term, I mean to restore them. So, I don't think that this analogy is, is a valid one. Yeah, I can say something. Yeah. What's your take on it? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. It's the recording apparatus that's damaged in conditions like Alzheimer's disease. And the classic thing a person with Alzheimer's disease will say to you is that I can remember exactly what I did 50 years ago, but I can't remember what I had for breakfast. And that's the, that's the classic sign because it's the recording part. Uh, so the, the memories are actually there somewhere, but because the, the ability to uh, maintain a short-term memory is lost, so the new memories are not formed. Uh, and that's, that's actually the signature of Alzheimer's disease, the inability to create new memories. Okay.
Okay, well look, um, this has been a very full and very rich discussion. Have you enjoyed it? Have you found it useful? I want to make two observations before I hand it back to Rob to bring the evening to a close. Uh, first one is, I've been absolutely struck by the way in which on every question, our two experts have complimented one another. They've added additional information. <laughs> and, uh, the amount of knowledge and the way in which a question is handled in which there's additional layers of information, additional insights being quite impressive to me. The other is that um, as part of um, Echwood's uh, biography, uh, as, as it was read out, you would have heard that he's the director of the Brain Disease Research Centre at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Now there's a centre and there's centres and there's centres, but the Brain Disease Research Centre in Jerusalem has got 65 laboratories. Now, you figure that, how many hundred scientists are working in those labs altogether? Including students, I no. would say something like probably 250? 250, 250 in those laboratories, so it's a massive, and Edward directs it. One of the things that you talked about last night, which impressed me immensely, uh, was the outreach uh, that the centre has to the state to, um, uh, you've got a school that you actually, uh, the students come in and they ask questions of the, of the uh, researchers. You can add a bit more to it in a moment because I'm going to invite you to do that. But the other is that the outreach which is educational uh, to the community. And in a sense, this is what's happened this evening. I mean, you've got two universities uh, brought together under the ages of the Friends of the Hebrew University in which we're outreaching, and this is one of the functions of the universities, uh, not only doing research, not only uh, doing teaching, but also connecting and engaging with the, with the community and answering questions. And I think what you've had this evening was you know, expert advice uh, provided generously by two outstanding scientists. Rob, now wait a minute, before I finish, would you like to do anything more about the Brain Disease Research Centre? Because it's what was one of the projects of the Friends of the Hebrew University Australian Friends. Yeah, I'll just say shortly, uh, so we don't have a school, we collaborate with the school and the idea is to uh, spark the enthusiasm among kids for science and uh, I think the, the most interesting thing that we do, we uh, explain the students what model systems we have, what can they use, and they design their own experiments. And once they design their own experiments and we truly don't know what the outcome is going to be, I mean the kids are very enthusiastic and uh, some of them contact me later on and they want to volunteer in laboratories and uh, we uh, also got some, uh, I would say, achievements of our students uh, that, um, I mean, kids that came to our um, ex experimental experience, I would call it. Uh, last year, for instance, there was the Israeli Olympics for uh, biotechnology organized by the Technion in Haifa and one of our students describe what he did in, in our center and, and won the, the gold medal there. So everybody was very happy. And uh, another activity that we, we do is uh, in a way similar to what we did this evening. We uh, teamed up with the Cinematheque in Jerusalem. So each activity, an expert, or one of the experts of the uh, center chooses a movie which is uh, being uh, shown to the audience, and then there is like 25 or 30 minutes uh, lecture and open to the uh, question of the public. And it's very successful, people uh, attend those uh, events. And I think that outreaching to the community, educating the next generation, supporting PhD students of the center, we support them with uh, fellowships to go and attend international meetings, this is what we are trying to do, and specifically we are trying to uh, identify the less privileged of them, like uh, people from uh, different ethnicities or people who are uh, coming from a less privileged background and support those people. And I truly thank the Friends of Hebrew in Australia because they, without their support we wouldn't be able to do all those uh, activities. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, all of you. A particular thanks to our panel and our moderator. Uh, I think you'll all agree that Leon brought out the very best in these two gentlemen. I also want to thank you, the audience, because without your questions, we wouldn't have had the depth of uh, the knowledge that came out here and the depth of these gentlemen's experience. I want to just touch on a few things, uh, some of the questions that were asked. Uh, one of the subjects, or one of the questions related to genes, and uh, we spoke a little bit about the negative side, uh, <laughs> Ashkenazic genes and uh, the Alzheimer's gene, but also there's, uh, in the Jewish community, a, a gene of excellence. And there's no doubt that listening to these gentlemen tonight, uh, our future is in good hands. And the same applies to the Hebrew University. Uh, I don't know of any other university in Israel that's produced eight Nobel Prize winners, a hundred Rothschild Prize winners. It's a university of excellence, and we're very proud uh, that it's produced people uh, like Ehud, and that we've got Ehud here with us in Australia. And uh, another symbol of the excellence of the Jewish community, of Jewish brain, of course, is uh, uh, Ashley. And uh, we really were very privileged to have the two of you here tonight. Somebody in the audience raised the question of ethics. And uh, on a number of occasions, Ashley referred to experimentation on animals, and so did Ehud. Uh, I want to share with you that we have at the Hebrew University a professor, Corbin Nachmias, who's trying to reproduce human physiology on a chip, uh, which means that they will be able to study things like Alzheimer's and uh, all sorts of other things on a chip instead of on an animal. And uh, that's just another example of the strides that are being made at the Hebrew University. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for joining us this evening. Please spread the word. Many who will hear from you will regret not having come. So one of the reasons why Sharon was walking around with a pen and paper was because she wanted to get your names and email addresses so that we can keep you informed of future events. Uh, on that note, I would like to extend a, extend a special thanks to Sharon Fink. Uh, Sharon's been fantastic. She came on board not that long ago, and uh, I'm really, really grateful for her support. We are trying to put together here a committee in uh, Victoria, and anybody who's interested, please feel free to be in touch with me. I also want to thank Ricky Fink. It's just coincidental. They both share the same surname, Fink. Uh, they are cousins, <laughs> but uh, they are the backbone uh, uh, of our uh, support base of our little committee that we're starting here. There are a couple of others who couldn't be here tonight, but I thank them for their support as well. Last but not least, I want to share with you at the back of the room, you'll find some leaflets for a legacy mission. Uh, next year, to coincide with Yomat Smawut, the Hebrew University, or the Australian Friends of the Hebrew University, thanks to the generous support of an anonymous donor, uh, we are offering an all-expenses-paid sort of free trip to Israel. <coughs> Why so sort of tree, free trip? Because by very virtue of the name being a legacy mission, uh, the motive is to encourage people to leave a legacy to the Hebrew University. Uh, many have done so in the past, without which the Hebrew University wouldn't have been able to deliver the high standards of excellence that we now come from the university. So please have a look at the uh, leaflet at the back. Consider it. Uh, we are advertising now fairly extensively. Uh, we're sharing with the community some of our successes and, as I say, including this legacy mission. So thank you again. Uh, the symbol of our uh, logo includes a torch, uh, a flame. Uh, we're moving towards Hanukkah. I would like to wish you all a Chag Hanukkah Samach. Uh, keep that torch alive by supporting the Hebrew University and everything of the best. Thank you.